your Christmas is going well. well. Hello. We do hope your Christmas. Can you bring me down just a little bit? Don't you appreciate people that step in and help out when somebody takes off? Amen. Thanks, Corey. Thank you very much. Fred's gone on a weekend getaway with his beloved for her birthday. So we're glad that Corey could step in and help us take care of that. Look at somebody and say, man, you're awesome. I just want to brag on you for a little bit if I could. Thanks for all that you did for CASA. We appreciate all the clothes and gifts and gift cards. There's still some out there. If you'd like to get some of those, you're welcome to. Matter of fact, there was some stuff that went to CASA that is not supposed to be CASA. So if you're missing something, see, there it is right there. It may, if, see what size it is. Maybe mine. No, <laughs> not mine. See, Jackie, if you're missing anything at all, thanks for all you did. I'll, I'll appreciate Lola and Alicia and all those that went downtown and passed out stuff on the, on the streets of Dallas. We appreciate that so much. And then this week we had a, a lady contacted our church through Facebook and Pastor Dustin connected with her. And, and we found out that uh, she was worried about her three grandkids in Houston may not have Christmas. So he arranged for me at a, or I guess you went up in the attic and found some presents. And we got, I took them out there yesterday and uh, the door opened opened the door, knocked on the door, the 13-year-old opened the door, and she was just surprised to see me totally, and we were able to bless them with a little gift card and some toys all wrapped up, and that was a special, you know, it's neat when you get to be involved with it, and, and it's not, and it's not uh, Santa Claus. I do a lot of that with Santa Claus, but uh, I've enjoyed a great season. This was probably one of my busy seasons, helping the man in red. Um, we, we saw some of you Thursday night at Chick-fil-A, and we've seen you all over everywhere, so it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for your Thanks for your tolerance of my habit of doing Santa Claus. Thank you. I enjoy that more. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoy that. I got a chance to go to uh, Renee's company the other day. And, and you know, I, I, I went, I, this week I've had two opportunities that I haven't had before. One of them was at my mother's assisted living center. And it was a lot of people, it was 160 some odd people, and most of them came to the big Christmas party. And we had, we sang and we had a great time. And then, but then we went to about, probably 20 or 30 rooms of people that can't get out of bed or can't, they can't speak. And uh, the, the, the social worker said, you know, it's amazing to me when I see um, people in the bed that don't normally respond, they perk up when they see Santa Claus. And it's just amazing. The same thing happened at Donald Elementary. That was Thursday first thing. And they're, they're, that's, they have a big communications department, which means they have trouble communicating, and they're special needs kids. And, and you walk into the room, and all of a sudden, Santa Claus is there. It's like a new world. They don't talk at all, but they start singing and making noise, and it's just a fun thing. So I enjoy. That's a blessing that I have totally, totally, totally. I really think sometimes we get away from the heart of Christmas. So I, I wanted to go back, and, and I've, I've, I've looked through my files, and I've preached every kind of imagine you can imagine, every kind of message from things on Mary and Joseph and everything. But I went back as I was looking through the files. I could not find that I'd ever preached on the manger. And I don't know why this stuck out to me. I guess it was from the, the I don't know why it came from. But I, I want to read, if you would, look at me, and, and let's look up the scriptures from Luke chapter 2. And let's just read the Christmas. Can you all see that from back there? Yeah. Good. Well, why don't you stand? Let's do a Jamie Howard thing. And y'all stand and let's read the word of God. I know most of you, you know, I like the, when we put the word up there because it's all the same word. It is all the same word, but sometimes we go to New International, New King James, English Standard Version. There's, you know, the, the Richard Plunk Version. But let's, let's read this together. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree, a consensus should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their hometown to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while there, there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Father, I thank you for the season of Christmas that we celebrate right now. And I pray this would be a marvelous, incredible, 
spiritual season for everybody in the house of grace. Father, whether we're traveling, whether we're going somewhere, whether we're not going, whether people are coming to our house, whether we're going to somebody else's house, where we just, whether we just spend a quiet evening at home, I pray this would be a wonderful season because this is the beginning point of something new and something different. So Father, I pray that you'd bring the manger into a new revelation point for us today. And I pray the blessings of God upon the house of grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Smile at somebody as you're seating. That was tough for some of you to do, to smile and sit at the same time. <clears throat> there are three times in this section of Luke that Jesus is mentioned as being in a manger. Uh, the place speaks a lot of different things to a lot of different people. When I think of manger, some of you that are horse people think of a feeding trough. Some of you that are cattle people think of where the cattle eat. Some of you think about the land. Matter of fact, I got a great conversation today with Mary Vereed. Do you realize this lady takes a whole quarter of a goat and she has it carved up and she makes goat in her house? <laughs> Who would have thunk it? This little bitty thing makes goat. It's never been one of my favorite things, but I like, I'm glad that she likes a goat. We were talking about lamb earlier. I don't like lamb, but she likes lamb. Now, I'm way off the subject now, totally, completely. <laughs> anyway, but if you have goats, then you might think about a manger or you might think about dinner tonight. So, <laughs> see, I brought that right back in there real quick. But I think there's some important lessons here that, that we need to think about in terms of the manger. Matter of fact, I even asked the guys to leave up the, the manger so we can kind of have a focal point today. Because you know when you think about the nativity scene, every time you see a nativity scene, you see a manger. There's always one. There's Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. But there's usually always the little feeding trough, the manger. So that's what we're going to bring our attention to today. And I want to, I, I, let me just show you a little, uh, you, you know, to many of us when we think of the manger, we think of, Away in a manger. Some of you think of many different things. Different, different things come to your mind. But it's very important. And I want to share this. I want this to be more of, of a children's sermon. Usually when the kids come down, we have the children's sermon. They usually talk about away in the manger. And the kids sing a manger. Matter of fact, our kids, didn't they do a great job last week? What a marvelous presentation. They did a marvelous job. Somebody was telling me they loved the little, the little uh, plates. Little Pat said, I want to go home and make one for myself so I can have my own little plate. But I thought the kids did a great job and they sang Away in a Manger. I want to show you this little video about Away in a Manger this morning.
I'm sleeping in a manger, Christ our King. Too many times we think of the manger as just something that has to do with kids and part of the nativity, but I think there's a focus there. It's not incidental that the, that the divinely appointed place for the Savior to be born, the Lord of God, was a beginning place. This is a place where it all started on earth. And I want to speak to you today about the three things that are mentioned in this particular chapter because I think that they bring up three different distinct things that happened from the manger. I want you to realize that the begin this was the beginning place. This was the focal point. This was, I'm going to call it the epicenter. Because when you think about an epicenter, that's a, a beginning place. A place where the power is released. A place where something starts and has great effects. When you think about an earthquake, you think of the epicenter because that's where all the power is unleashed from. And results happen for miles around because of what happens in a wall, real small little epicenter. The epicenter is, is the exact place where it's, everything is released. So I want to look at three things today. And I was telling Jay earlier, I've changed my, even my, my outline since the Wednesday night. The first thing I want you to bring to your attention is the manger is the epicenter of the incarnation. The incarnation. When we think about the beginning place, it's the incarnation. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling place. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace. When you look at the Christmas story and you read about the manger as a cattle feeding trough, you must realize this is the epicenter, the beginning place of the incarnation. Now, that may not mean a lot to as many people. It's more a theological term. But it's really a, a Latin term that means with flesh. When you have have chili con carne, you have chili with flesh. This is the incarnation. This is, uh, I've told you this before, this is one of my favorite questions to ask every young ordained minister. What, is the word, what does the word incarnation mean? And I've heard all kind of different illustrations, but it really means in flesh. We must realize that this is the epicenter, the beginning point, the release of power of where the incarnation happened. I want you, I want you to just think theological for just a moment. Because there were historical teachers that would say that Jesus wasn't truly man. He was something other than a man. He was a ghost or he was a, a phantom. Folks, I want you to realize the whole meaning of the manger is that Jesus is God coming incarnate, in flesh, in real life. Jesus was not a ghost. He was not that God, John calls him the Logos, the Logos. The incarnation was, the only, was only possible because of the virgin birth of Jesus, an event foretold by the prophets that they could not understand. Isaiah chapter 7, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. The wonderful mystery of this moment is that the second person of the Godhead launched out of heaven and came to earth and became flesh. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a spirit. He came all without natural procreation. This is why it's important for us to realize he became a real man, a real person, a baby. He was born. He was wrapped in cloths and we laid in a manger. From the throne of glory, he came to a feeding trough. He came to a manger. Paul spoke, speaks of this in Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same of that of Jesus Christ, who being of very nature God, did not consider him equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. God became man, and being found in the appearance as himself, he humbled himself, or he emptied himself, and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now that Greek word is, is epikonosis, or ekonosis means he emptied himself. He was very God, a very God, and he came forth into the country, into the world, as an incarnate person, a fleshly person, and he emptied himself of his godness. But he was still totally God and totally man. We must realize that, matter of fact, the Greek said he was morphe. He was, he was man. He has feelings. When he got hungry, what did he do? He fed 5,000. When he was tired, he slept. When he was in the midst of a storm and his disciples were scared, he stills the wind. But he became a man. It means Jesus, the Messiah, bypassed the curse on the rest of mankind because of our sin. Because he had no sin. But yet he was incarnate. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. There was no sin involved in this at all. There was no natural creation. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. 
And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. For he shall save his people from their sin. He will be God with us. Yet God with all of his first comings. This was a man who came to become the suffering servant. Isaiah speaks, speaks about this in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. John identified him when he presented himself for water for baptism. John chapter 129, the next day John saw the, Jesus coming toward him and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We must realize that the manger represents the very fact that God of very God became a very man of very man. It is the epicenter of the incarnation. This is a tremendous Christian doctrine that you must not gloss over. God is real God, but he is really man to come to be your sacrifice. To be the price that was paid. Now Mary takes this precious, priceless gift. The one who was to save them from their sin. And bring peace to the world. And she lovingly wraps him in cloths. Swaddling clothes. Bandages, if you were. This is what they used to wrap dead bodies in. It was what they clothed him. And they laid him in a feeding trough in a manger. Hmm. God steps into our world. He wanted us to know what he was like. You know, I always like that at Christmas time when we think about babies and look about little Dean who was back there with his grandmother in the back and I think about this brand new. You know, God wanted you to know what he was like. So he steps into from all from heavens and he steps into the earth and he ends up in a manger. Now he could have come as a great ruler on a big white horse. He could have come as a great wise leader, but he came as a baby. Because that's what God wanted you to know what he was like. He's a baby. So small that he could be put in a feeding trough. Mm. Number two. The manger also is the epicenter of an invasion. It's an epicenter of an incarnation. But he's the epicenter of an invasion. Of God's kingdom to the earth. It's an invasion by a kingdom. The kingdom of God invades the earth. The beginning point. The epicenter of this kingdom invades. God's kingdom enters the world through a manger. We should not be surprised that the shepherds were the first ones that were told about. When you look at Luke chapter 2 verse 8 if we, as we're, where we stop reading. The shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior is born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign of you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Where did God tell the, where did the angel tell the shepherds to find this new king, this new Messiah? In a manger, in a feeding trough. Hmm. In the devotional book, I don't know if some of you bought the book by Joe Castleberry. He spoke for us back earlier this year. President of Northwest University, he, he, in his devotion, he, he had one page, one chapter about the, the shepherds. You know, most of us talk about the shepherds were the lowest of the low and they were just the outcasts of society and surprising that, that God would tell them first. And I think, no, we, he, he talks about this. He said, no, for the Israelites, they were respected. It was an honorable profession, honored by Abraham. Abraham had sheep. It was, it was honored by the Israelites as a nation. It's how they gained their wealth, by raising sheep. David served as a shepherd. Psalms 95 likens God to a shepherd. We are sheep of his pasture. It was said that some Jewish literature at the time, after the New Testament, cast a shadow on the reputation of the shepherds. Now, why would they want to do that? It was the shepherds that went and told everybody about Jesus, the Messiah. He's come. And they're going, oh, those are just low-life people. We don't, we don't, don't we'll give them any count. That was amazing that I heard that. But remember why the shepherds were so close to Jesus when he was born? They were in the fields nearby. Now, why would they be in the field? They were the ones responsible for providing lambs for temple sacrifices. I never cross thought about that until I realized that's why those shepherds were close by. They were taking care of the lambs that would be offered in the temple for sacrifice. Now think about that. Why do you think the first people they would go to to tell them about the new king that was born, the new Messiah, would go to the shepherds? Because they were the ones responsible for bringing sacrifices to the temple. And now they're going to be the ones that are going to spread the news that the new lamb has been born. Hmm. 
The Messiah was born into this world by the birth of a miracle, virgin birth. So the first to knew, know about this was the shepherds. The high priests weren't there. The Pharisees, they were there. The Sadducees weren't there. King Herod, not even the Roman Caesar was there. The angels knew where this place was and that the king was born. They knew all about it. And notice it also, it was not a sweet little girl like you saw in the video. This was a host. Matter of fact, a good translation, it's an army of angels. They brought the, they brought the sound with them. They brought the excitement. They brought the, it was incredible. Glory to God in the highest. We got a new king. It's the epicenter of the invasion of the kingdom of God. That's something to get excited about. You know, too often we relegate the manger to a little scene with a few sprigs of hay coming at it with a little child and a, maybe a kid with a... And that's a beautiful thought. But I want you to see the other side of the manger. This is the invasion of a kingdom of God. Amen. You know, the problem is I was, we've watched a lot of D-Day movies lately. Because of the anniversary and all that happened, and and they when the when the when the Coast Guard watchers called back to the said the the, the invasion is on, they're coming on the shores. What what do we do? Oh, they're not coming there. They refuse. He's going, but the army is coming. It's here. Be ready. The invasion is happening. Oh no, it hadn't. You've just been drinking something. Just go back. It's all right. They refuse to receive it. I think that's kind of what happened in this story. The angels realize that, that the kingdom is coming. The invasion is happening. He comes through a small manger. Do we receive it? The kingdom who is, on, is, is now on earth. Where is the king? We are with the king. The king is with us. Where the kingdom of God is now, it's at home. Someday the king is going to return. But right now we realize the kingdom has invaded beginning in Mary. The kingdom will come to the earth in power and glory. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. Now too often we can see the baby in the manger as a little bitty. But can you imagine this little one has the government on his shoulders. And he will be called the wonderful counsel or mighty God. Everlasting father. The prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. Establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Jesus entered the human history in a hard place. In a difficult time. In a makeshift crib. But he's here. He's with us. This was the beginning point. The place where all the force of the, the invasion of the kingdom happens. It starts in a little manger. Mm. And the angel said to the shepherds, this will be a sign to you. This will be a sign to you. But you'll find him in a manger wrapped in cloth strips. Such a simple proof of the greatest miracle that ever happened. The manger scene becomes the beginning point of a new kingdom invasion. So I want you to realize every time you see that, that manger in whatever shape or form or fashion, I want you to realize that's the epicenter of the incarnation. God putting on flesh. But it's also the epicenter of an invasion, a kingdom coming into our world. Hmm. Songs have been sung son about it. Oh, holy night. Bob does such a marvelous job of that. The stars are brightly shining the night. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angels' voices. Oh, night divine. Oh, night. Even the songwriters know that was such a special night. It was the beginning of an invasion of the king. Manger was a beachhead of God's kingdom and power that would overthrow and defeat the power of the enemy. Yes. Oh, the power of Jesus would be there by the sin, the reduce, redeeming us from, from his own shed blood. There is a cross that's, that's to come. There's a second coming to come. But I want you to focus today on the manger as the epicenter of the invasion of the kingdom. Mm. And thirdly, and I'll wrap up. There's, the manger should be the epicenter of what I'm going to call the initialization. 
I used to call it the New Beginnings. You can call it New Beginnings, but I like to have my sermons all in the same words. So I, I want you to say that the beginning is the epicenter of the initial, the initialization, the initiation, the New Beginnings. This is the New Beginnings. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 15. When the angels had left them, they'd gone to heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Wow, we have seen some strange things. But the scripture says, that, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they spread the word concerning all that had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They gazed at the baby in the manger and they realized that the angels had said, this is a savior. They, mighty, they, they might have thought about a military leader to res, rescue them from the Roman domination. But the angel said it would be Christ the Lord, the Messiah, the hope of Israel, the son of David, the son of man, the son of God. It's a brand new beginning. They probably didn't even realize, and realize, understand what was going on, but they received it in faith. Can you imagine if an if a angel appears to you? It says, I want you to get over to Bethlehem and look at a manger and you're going to find the new king of Israel. He's Messiah. He's the, the one that's going to change the world. And they're going, we better go. We better find out. So off they went and there they found him. But the angel said to him, do not fear. Mary, you have found favor with God. And you'll be with child and give birth to a son. And you will give him the name Jesus, for he will be called the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his David, of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will not end. The world does not even know everything is changing that night. Everything changed that night. There's a song that's out now that I like, and, and I started to sing it for you today, and I thought other better wise. It says, a baby changes everything. A baby changes everything. And every mom, I'm sure, whatever your name is, Amy and Brian, <laughs> they can sing that song with new understanding. A baby changes everything. A baby changes everything. It's the epicenter of the new creation has begun. A new covenant. New birth is possible. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. There's going to be a new testament, new heavens, new earth, new body that makes up the, of Jews and Gentiles, a new anointing of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, a new revelation of the glory of God. All things because new, because in the manger was the initialization of the new beginning that comes with the Christ child. Those who gazed on the baby in the manger saw a miracle which none of them could comprehend. Mary and Joseph saw a baby. The shepherd saw a newborn lamb. Later, the wise men saw a king, but here he is, God in flesh. You may have heard, or they may have heard the, the cries of a new baby boy, but we can hear the roar of a lamb, the beginning of a new kingdom. Here's the one that will bruise the head of the serpent. Here's the one that we should sing, Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. If you ever d doubt that God loves you and is with you, remember the manger in Bethlehem. There's power in new beginnings for your life because of Christ Jesus. There's a new beginning. A whole new world system changed that night because of a, a manger. There's power in new beginnings in your life because of the God, Jesus, born on that night. I heard a funny story the other day reminded me. I teach in the School of Ministry of the district. So we're teaching classes and we had a new student that just started this month in December. He's from West Africa. And he has a pretty hard accent, but he's, he's really doing well. And God's blessed in him. And he shared his life. And he shared the story about how that his life has changed through the years. I believe he's from, from, from um, Ivory Coast. But he said, talked about how his life has changed. And he ended up coming over to the northeast part. Then he ended up in, t attending a church here in the North Texas area. And he's going for his studies to become a, a minister with the Assemblies of God. And he's talked about, Christmas always reminds him 
that he is who he is today because of the new beginnings that started in a manger. And I said, wow, I need to put this in the sermon. But he said, the, the hope for tomorrow is the fact that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, as the new beginning for my life. And he said, you know, as I was walking along the path, I'd take this step and it would be a misstep. He said, God would bring me back and I'd, I'd go off in this direction and it would be a misstep and a misstep. And then God would bring me back. He said, but then every time I thought about the beginnings, the new beginning that happens in the manger with the birth of Jesus Christ, who gave me power to be cleansed from my sins, he said, it turns my missteps into a new step. And he started dancing around the stage. And he got excited because all of a sudden he realized he was not like the old person before. All the missteps that he took because of the new beginnings that happened in a manger, he turned his life around to Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden he said, I have a new dance. I have a new dance because of what happened in the manger. Jesus Christ came to the earth and he became my redeemer and took away my missteps and gave me a new step to follow him. Amen. I thought that is incredible. But I want you to see the manger not as a feeding trough today, not as a bed for a baby, not as just another prop in a Christmas program, but as the epicenter, a place for the incarnation of God. God, a very God, to come to the earth to walk among us. I want you to see the manger as the epicenter of the invasion. A new kingdom has arrived. I want you to see the manger as the epicenter of the initial things that are coming in your life. There's an old song that most of you know well. Some of you are not as old as I am, so you don't know this old song. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. I want you to see the, the manger as the epicenter of an incarnation. God came in the flesh just for you. I want you to see the manger as the epicenter of the invasion of a new kingdom. But I want you to see the manger as the epicenter of the initiation of your new life in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the, the gift of Christmas. The message of Christmas. The message of Christmas that comes in the form of a manger. Because it brings so many new things. The flesh of God, the kingdom of God, the new life in God. So Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us and may this be, may this kingdom, may this kingdom celebration of Christmas be one that brings new hope, new life, new experience. But Father, I pray today that it would bring new, newness that comes all the way from the power back in Bethlehem to this day in Flower Mound to make a difference in our life. In Jesus' name. Now while you're praying and while every head's bowed, I just want to ask you today, is your name written down in heaven? Do you have a new name written down because of the blood of Jesus Christ? Because of the birth that happened in a manger? If you'd like to, me to pray with you, I want, I want you to be able to, to start Christmas from a new beginning today. And you'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I begin a new life at this Christmas season? I'm going to place my trust in Jesus Christ. Would you just slip up your hand anywhere in the building? Anywhere in the building. I don't want anybody to miss an opportunity to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. He came for you. He came to bring a new life. He came to you to bring new, new revelation. Praise God. I invite you to stand this morning. We don't ever want our prayer time to be one that's just something we do as an afterthought in our service. But we know that there are people here today that need somebody to agree with them, somebody to pray with them, somebody to encourage them, somebody just to hug them. So our prayer, we have prayer partners that come to the front. So we're, well, we're early today. We've got a whole 15 minutes. So I'm not into your lunchtime, but for 15 more minutes.
So if you need prayer today, you want somebody to anoint you with oil, you need healing, you need salvation, you need anything. Our, our prayer partners are coming. You join them. You come with them, would you? If you're not coming for prayer, stay and pray. Find somebody there around you and pray with them. You got, you got 16 more minutes to give me, and then you can slip out. God bless you. You come and pray as we take a time to pray for you this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We got a great praise report. Judy Bailey just sent a text to LaDonna that Velma's out of surgery. She's doing well. Had four stents put in and she's doing good. So praise God. Praise God. She has been through a, a lot with cancer and all kinds of tumors. And praise God. She's with her daughter in Houston in Florida. So let's keep her in our prayers. And so. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make this be a wonderful Christmas season. I pray that every time you see the manger, you'll think of the, the beginning point. The outward stretch of power that comes in the incarnation, the invasion, and the initialization of new beginnings. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray you'd have traveling safeties if you go somewhere this week. Be safe. Open one more present. Do me one more favor as you celebrate Christmas. Read the Christmas story and celebrate the birth of our son, God's son, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.